I just wanted to ask one question. Anybody don't want to be videoed? What do you going to do with this video? Share it with Sharon. Shannon. Yeah. So if you don't, I mean, if, if you don't, just let me know and I, I won't do it. But it's almost like saying, I, I came here personally so I could get to meet you and to start working with you, start doing some videos for you. And because the topic is so hot, uh, and the discussion, I wanted to get content from individuals on how they felt and why they felt the way they feel. So if anyone feels like they're not comfortable being um, videoed tonight, just no problem. Maybe, should they let you know before they start talking? Well, what I can do, I was going to take the camera and put it right there and they start talking. What I can do is just stay right where I'm put. And I just get your voice and won't get your face. Will that work? Okay, we're good. We're good. <laughs> Does everyone kind of understand what we're doing here tonight? Uh, the Hereford County Schools followed this format when we were talking about diversity issues. And I found that it worked really well because once people have a chance to talk and speak in turn, you find that people who don't normally talk want to talk. So I, we'll, we'll try this format and we'll get a discussion going. And again, let's try to be respectful of each other and look at each other as we're talking and try to get a real dialogue going. Does everyone understand what we're trying to do? Okay. All right. Um, sh shall we have a timer? Right? All right. So we're going to try to keep everyone's comments to under two minutes. And then I'm sure we're going to have a chance to come back through and talk again. So we're going to start. Um, Bert, you want to go first? Bert, you can move to the back. So I wouldn't go first. Um, I don't care if you do that. And you can stand if you like. Can anybody not hear me? Uh, my name is Bert Berlin. I had the distinction last week of celebrating my 75th birthday. Okay, so, birthday. so I've seen a few things. I've never before seen three members of, the, of a government uh, charged all at once. So this is a, a new event for me. That's yeah, 75. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
I am, as I assume everybody else in the room, very upset of the, over the events of the last two weeks. I find, I find it very strange because uh, I happened to be up in New Jersey celebrating with my family when all this stuff hit the news. And it was interesting. I came back to Richmond and I was looking through, through tweets and I saw a tweet from the Democratic State Party praising the governor on what a great job he was doing. And then two days later, they were demanding his resignation. Same, same group of people. Uh, I almost, you know, I almost get the feeling, you know, in politics, you don't need enemies because your friends will get you eventually anyhow, <laughs> which is which is a kind of sad thing. I mean, one of the things I've always been interested in is uh, people who run for office who have in their heart the desire to do something that affects uh, all of the people positively. Uh, I, I don't believe in ethnic politics, I don't believe in racial politics, I don't believe in gender politics. Uh, you know, I get into this argument with my wife a lot, I said I will never vote for somebody because of their race, their gender, or, you know, or anything else. And she, and she says, but she wants to see a woman president before she dies. I said, well, that's fine. If she's the most qualified, I'll vote for her. Uh, I think as far as Virginia is, oh, my time is up. Good. Uh, and do you want to finish your time? No, I just going to change the subject, so. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to talk about Virginia. Okay. Uh, Charles, you want to go next? Sure. Um, Charles Small. Uh, just keeping it brief, I just... I just want to judge people what they do now, today, yesterday, in current times. Not, and, uh, all I can think is the whole thing seemed to be a complete debacle from the abortion issues and duty issues. And I just feel like there's just some sort of lack of leadership somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know how. So it fell apart like that. So, other than that, I'm here to listen. Thank you. Hi, I'm Courtney Gardner, and um, I'm also here to listen. Um, my reaction was, yeah, it was kind of, I could hardly believe it, <laughs> what was happening. And, um, and it is funny, the, um, funny um, disturbing <coughs> the way things escalated and, um, from an issue that was fabricated, I believe, um, absolutely into something real. And Excuse me, I'm heading off the time here. Yeah. Okay. Because, because you're talking Talk in this her. direction. Um, okay, where could we go? No, but um, I was saying it, the progression of it from a, like a fabricated issue, in my opinion, and, and to something real to something, um, to what it has become, is, to me, it is mind-boggling and disturbing. That's what I always say. I'm here to listen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Kumar? <laughs> Hello, I'm Ashok Kumar. Uh, I'm a physician. I retired about seven, eight months ago. Exactly. <laughs> 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 Thank you. I thought 40 years of cardiology was good enough, and cardiology was interventional, which means day and night and all that. Um, if that is the only topic we're going to talk about tonight, my point is that um, I don't follow Facebook very much. I log in once a month or so, so I really don't know what's going on. I wait for the newspapers. I'm the old-fashioned guy. I flip through the pages next day. And I read several newspapers and see what the investigative reporters whose job is to find out these things have said. And I come to my own conclusions. My initial reaction was, um, it was very obvious to me that the governor was not a politician in the way he responded. He was not skillful, smooth, suave. He just said, I have done something bad, and he didn't realize he was not in the page, I believe. Next day when he corrected, that's what I learned, that he was not in the page. But that was 
common thing and from what I know of 40 years of practice in this area. When I first came to town, I went to get an apartment in Petersburg and there was this apartment complex for a half, for an apartment condo. The guy opened the door, there was a sign in the front, it said for rent, and as soon as I opened the door and I was wearing a tie, a jacket, everything, and uh, I said, is there a place for rent? He looked at me and said, we don't rent for people like you and slammed the door on my face. And this was 1985, and I have had many experiences like that. So I cannot not uh, uh, forget that those things happened at the time. And my colleagues have told me in MCV, uh, the Caucasians had all the floors, and the African Americans were in the basement in the hospitalization, and they were not allowed to mix. One of the practitioners in Petersburg was a very kind gentleman. All the Caucasians could come through the front door and sit in the waiting room. But he was kind enough to see African Americans if they came through the back door and sat in the waiting room and after he finished all the Caucasians, he could go and see the black people. And he saw them and they were grateful because he was taking care of them. And many other physicians did not see black people at that time as patients. And I heard, and so over the years I had so many experiences where people have said several things. So what I'm saying is those, there was very bad ratio problems years ago and what the governor and the attorney general did was definitely not extravagant for them to resign and uh, um, just just in fair facts you know we got to find him guilty first before you want to kick him out he deserves the rule of law he deserves the chance to explain himself and go from there Thank you. I don't know if you all know, but Chuck is my brother-in-law. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think he should have remember seeing the retirement party picture or something. So. <laughs> we wanted to retire and run for office. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Lepa Kumar. I'm the other sister. sister. <laughs> um, I had planned to talk tonight, had basically come to listen to what everybody had to say. It's a very volatile topic. Uh, Virginia has been in the news for all the wrong reasons. It's international news. People have been saying all over the world what's going on in Virginia. This is certainly a first. I've never heard of anything like three leaders having to, you know, have their jobs in jeopardy. So it's a very volatile issue. I've basically come to listen and I want to hear what people say. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Matt. Yes. I would echo what Lata just said, but uh, I'd like to add that when uh, the governor um, changed his stance the second day, I was very disappointed because uh, anyone would remember whether they were in the picture or not, um, whether they have posed as such or not. And he seemed to be wishy-washy about it. So, you know, that was not right. And another thing that comes to my mind is when we go for the meet and greet uh, events with different politicians, like I attend small events where there are all brown people. And I really wonder how they perceive us. <laughs> huh? What do you all think? <laughs> yeah, that's a new politicians who don't have experience uh, running for office and suddenly they meet so many different communities, all Asian or all Chinese and you know, what do they really think about? I'm not sure that comes from money early now. But I wish they would be a little more open and to talk to us, you know, one-on-one -on -one dialogue. Okay. Thank you. That makes sense. Rapali? Oh, my name is Rapali. Uh, I mostly came to listen, but um, um, being a first Amer, first generation immigrant to U.S. Uh, and being brown, uh, and I've stayed in mostly I don't want to waste this thing, but I've stayed in mostly um, Southern Oregon, which was 
really a white community and being one of the first brown people who tried to volunteer, who tried to work over there. I had some sort of experience with like you did uh, about, you know, which country you're from and all that. But I think as a, you know, in my new country, I think we should, everybody faces discrimination to some degree. You know, we have to take it with a pinch of salt, learn lessons from it, and everybody has something in their history growing up that they might have done something that they're not proud of. I mean, other than a Kennedy, I don't know anybody who goes growing up thinking I'm going to be in politics, you know? <laughs> Nobody thinks no. from <coughs> kindergarten that I'm going to be in politics. I should not do something that is going to hurt somebody. But being, I think it's a moral compass. It's, you do good and you accept people for what they are and try not to be prejudiced. And that's, so I don't think, I'm not sure what I think about the current state where you're demanding people to resign because of a picture. 30 years ago when whatever, I mean, whatever, how many years ago, but the times were different at that time, times are different now. Perceptions were different at that time, perceptions are different now, so everybody's growing, learning. What I would think funny 20 years ago, I don't find funny now, you know? So I, I, I just think we should be open and tolerant and see that he's not doing something really, really bad before we ask them to resign because we don't see Republicans who are doing even worse things being demanded to resign. Oh, you're you know? president. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, because it's like, you know, we have so many other examples where they've done really bad things and nobody's asking them to resign. So that's my She said, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> you can run along. You take a chair? Oh, you gotta talk loud. You probably would stand up and maybe refer to us if you don't mind. Well, I, I kind of believe that everyone, no matter whatever color you are, black, white, brown, whatever you want to call yourself, Ethiopian, white, black, Asian, I think we all need to learn how to get, to, get along. Because that's how I was raised. And I'm, I'm, my religion, I'm a Christian, and by me doing that, I've learned how to be able to try to deal with everybody. And by me going to college and stuff, I've had white roommates, black roommates, Chinese, and you can have an age, a Filipino. You just learn how to work together. And I think more, if people try more to just put the color aside, try to be able to deal with each other in the right way, we would, this country would be so much better. So I think that's what we need to concentrate on more than just the color of the skin. Thank you. Uh, I'm Marshall. Uh, I really just came to listen, but I think that conversations like these are, you know, kind of very healthy and the way we move forward with past, you know, something like this. It's uh, not something you see coming, so uh, I think having a conversation like this is, is the best way forward. A good start, at least. Thank you. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Evie. Um, I, I've been thinking about it a lot, and mostly what I've been thinking about is that I don't feel qualified to, uh, to have an opinion, um, an informed opinion, because uh, this all happened in 1984, which is about eight years before I was born. Um, so I have no idea what life was like back then. Um, um, and, uh, <laughs> Yes, yes, I'm 27, all right. Um, so um, the, uh, the only thing that I've sort of come up with um, when it comes to Northam's uh, blackface and, and the disturbing uh, KKK picture is, um, is uh, if, if you're standing next to a friend and somebody walks up to you and turns around and punches your friend in the stomach, you don't have the right to press charges against that person. The person who presses charges is the friend who got punched in the stomach. So, um, and, and you, can, you can support them, but you can't make that decision for them. So uh, basically that's, with Northam, that's basically where I'm at, where I, I'm, I'm too young to understand the climate uh, back then, and I'm white, so 
I don't understand the emotional like gut punch to that, but the people who are old enough to know the climate and who are black um, and, and people of color who, who do understand, well, I mean, specifically um, people who are black, um, who do who, who were attacked, it's not really my, my place to like say, this is what should happen because I'm not the one who got attacked, if that makes sense. Yeah. So that's my, that's my opinion is that I, and supporting people who, I'm just gonna, you know, support people who have an informed opinion because I, I don't think that I am in a position to have one. Very good, thank you. Uh, Frank? I'm Frank. Uh, I came here to listen to, but also I'm hoping that when we get done here, we do have a good positive program to go after. This, I, 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 I'm retired almost 40 years, 15 years now, uh, and I've been very active in politics in Pennsylvania and everything else and down here now, recently, the last several uh, years. It is shocking. I am saddened by all of this. I am not surprised. In 2016, some of you heard this a little bit before, 2016, when Trump lost the state of Virginia, he said, I lost this because we didn't run my campaign. He set advisors down to take over the Republican Party. In 2017, I helped Courtney Lynch run for supervisor. It was racial all the way. She got endorsed by the, by the, by the mayor of Richmond. They, we heard it was coming, and it did. They put out three or four flyers, major flyers, where they made her look whiter and blonder hair and him darker. They admitted it because we, we knew it was coming, so we alerted the press and went after them. They, we also knew that they were gonna set up a fake uh, Facebook page and they were going to have an African-American woman disgrace Courtney. We found out about it. They went there. The woman said, I don't, I'm 77 years old. I don't even have a computer. But they did it. All right, they did it. Last year during Abigail's campaign, they, they sent in a spy to come in as a double agent to find out what's going on. All right? Several months ago in the county here, we've had people from the... From the Americans were from Prosperity show up at our Democratic meetings. This past week, my wife got an eight-page flyer from them asking for a donation. They're in here on the state level, on the county level, and on the precinct level, and they're doing a number. And I know we would have to sit here and listen and talk about everything, but we have to come out with a very positive, aggressive campaign to counteract everything they're doing. Thank you, Frank. Abby, do you have anything to say? Um, Sure. So, for just for quick clarification, I'm from California. So, <laughs> almost I can't really judge Virginian racial relations and politics because, to put it this way, if someone tried to pull blackface where I came from in San Francisco, they would have been expelled <laughs> without question. It just does not happen. So, even in the '80s, it just did not happen. The culture is about anti that as you can get. So, I'm coming from that perspective. This. And it's, I flipped multiple times on what I thought Northam should do and what was best for the state. And at this point, I'm leaning towards he needs to resign, not just because of the phone, not just because of what he's done, but because of how he's handled it. I don't know who's, who his public affairs person is, but they, he needs a new one, or he needs to get his, his stuff in check because. I, every single time he has gone public since this photo has come out, he's consistently made some pretty horrendous errors and miscalculations in how to handle things. Okay. I don't know how many saw the, t the TV interview, but he made the point that the first Africans coming to Virginia were indentured servants. He was right. He was right, but that's not something you want to say after that kind of photo, after that photo has come out. He also talked about how he was reading the book Roots and how it was changing him. Like, <laughs> you say these kind of massive miscalculations that are just completely destroying like in any chance of redemption, which he should be aiming towards right now if he wants to recover his political career. That's kind of all I have to say. Thank you. I'm, your name, sorry. I'm Matt. For those who don't know, I'm part of the College Democrats here. I'm helping time everything and making sure the discussion is facilitated. And my opinion on the whole scenario is full disclosure to the executive board, which I am a member. We did call on Governor North to resign. 
design reviewed, especially it was frustrating, like hearing from you know some of the spend that oh he was in medical school, oh he was in college, he didn't know better back then. You know it was frustrating for me as a college student since we do have an awareness that our actions have consequences and regardless if he was in the photo or not, and regardless of the intent of blackface, there is still someone in the KKK hood and that generally isn't seen, you know, that shows like a more malicious intent than something that was, oh, it was simply we were boneheaded kids. So we were, you know, after the debate, we decided to call him to resign and his press conference afterward didn't help much either. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Ellie. I'm also a student here. Um, I definitely have feelings about this. Uh, yeah, I think I would agree that like, I've kind of gone back and forth about them. Um, but mostly, I think that I have the advantage of having heard almost everyone speak, and you guys all offer like really interesting perspectives of the rest to you know backgrounds and kind of the angle that the situation is is being approached. So I think I'm gonna hang out and listen a little more before I say anything. <laughs> um, okay. My name is Melissa Marion. I'm from. Originally from Pennsylvania, but I've been here in Virginia for over 50 years, so I've been here much longer than I've lived anywhere else. And when it, this all happened, I didn't understand blackface at all. I grew up in western Pennsylvania in a relatively, uh, not rural, but area that I had, knew no black people. The first black person I ever met was when I went to the conservatory, I was on the student council, and the president was this black tenor who was wonderful. So I didn't know this, but I did research. Okay. So this is what I, I went and I looked up what on earth was happening. First of all, I think Northam did not handle it well. He really did not handle it well. And I, I'm very disappointed in that. And I'm worried about the Democratic Party, but it's very uh, interesting how did this come about mentioned about the interview on TV about calling the uh, first blacks in 1619 uh, indentured servants. And everyone said, oh, that's horrible. But if anybody went to PBS, heard there, there's a program on the history of blacks in America, they were considered indentured servants. Sure. And Governor Northam, he originally at a lecture at a black university called them slaves. And the professor of history at that black university corrected him and said they were not slaves, they were indentured servants. And that's how and why he changed it. That's very interesting. Yeah, that. so <laughs> okay. The Washington Post did a beautiful story on, they went to the Eastern Shore and interviewed so many, many people about it. Um, when he was in the sixth grade is when the integration of the schools occurred. And his parents did not take him out and put him in a white academy. He went from sixth grade all the way through high school in a black school. With, with, with a, he was very few of the whites. In fact, there were only two white boys on the high school basketball team and he was one of them. Mm -hmm. His father was a prosecutor and then a judge who was absolutely horrified at any racial problems. He was not he was considered very, very liberal as far as racism was concerned. Northam, when he was at, um, in the army, there, he was driving home from his camp with another guy from his hometown, and a black woman from his platoon was from the same area. And they squeezed her into his little car to bring, give that girl a ride home. And so I'm finding out about his history and his family and what's going on. His roommate at the college, at the med school, said they had three flags in their, their uh, dorm room. The United States flag, the Virginia flag, and the flag about, oh, I can't think of the other thing. And one of his friends came in, where's the Confederate flag? Northern's answer was, that was a long time ago. That war is way over. So this is what you're talking about, this man. He did a wrong thing, if he did it correctly. But I want to tell you, the, um, 
what I'm thinking of. What is love? What is forgiveness? And what happened 35 years ago? Think of what he's accomplished since then. Mm -hmm. Nothing has he, that he has done <clears throat> has reflected that way he, what that happened in 84. And the other thing is, what did he do? He was for uh, increasing, increasing the, the uh, voter registration. He was for the uh, health type of thing. He, he, he would, I, I don't know if you heard him when he was in the Senate describing to these people who wanted to put uh, invasive ultrasound for abortions, describing in detail what that ultrasound was going to be, yes. that invasive one. He has done so much for our people so that I think I want to have him forgiven. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am? Yes. I'm cool. I'm, I'm going to make a statement. Okay. Of course. No, you good. Okay. I want to take this from a, to a different perspective. Face the camera. Face the camera. Oh. <laughs> the camera on this? Face. <laughs> Face the camera. I want to look at this from a different perspective. And that is faith. We all have different religions, but we all sit around faith. What would that supreme power be? We've always been taught to forgive. I didn't say forget, I said forgive. Now, if I've done something over 30 years ago, and I've been making positive contributions to society, are you gonna kick me out? Are you going to kick me out for the one thing I've done? And you see all the positive I've done? So I'm saying, how have we gotten as a society, as a people, but we are not able to have a conversation with each other? Because they say, if you and I cannot agree, we bring in that third person, and then we come up to some conclusion, but we don't forget all about that. So what kind of society have we become to take what somebody else said and just jump on the bandwagon and say, you got to go? What are we teaching our children in this scenario? Have we really lost our minds? Mm -hmm. Or do we care? Or are we just trying to get publicity from someone? And that's what I want to see, find out what happened. If you and I disagree, do we not come together and discuss this? Do I go to the media and just slander you? All right? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my name is Anne Marie. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Vina for doing this because it's weird that it feels weird to talk to people face to face instead of online, but I will admit it feels really weird, but it feels really good, so thank you for doing that, and hopefully this is something we can do more of under your leadership, under other leaders' leadership, and hopefully under better circumstances too. Um, so just offering a, a bit of a, a counterpoint to what you said and Rapali and Melissa about taking this in context of it happened a long time ago and, and looking at everything that Governor Northam in particular um, has done for us, although you know, all of our comments have kind of centered on Governor Northam, but we, we have a whole whole bigger <laughs> picture here. There's a whole slate. There's a whole, whole slate. Um, for me, I had a very immediate and visceral reaction to the picture. That imagery is just horrifying to me, and I just, as, as soon as Gov the governor issued his first statement saying that was me and I apologize. I mean, I was one of the first people out there. He's got to resign. This is horrible. But thinking about it, it's maybe not so much that he did it 30, 40 years ago, but that wanting to be the leader of this state, he didn't think it was important enough to talk about it when he was running, didn't think it was that, didn't realize the impact it would have on his constituents, and didn't think it was something he needed to be upfront and honest about from the beginning. And that has more been where my 
anger has been directed. Now, since then, obviously, we've had a whole lot of other stuff happening, and honestly, at this point, I just feel punch drunk, and I will admit, yeah, and I will admit that I've, I've gone from just being, you know, adamant about who needs to resign and who needs to go to just being like, oh my God, we have to huddle now and just protect what we've accomplished and figure out how we do muddle through it from here without creating too much destruction of the good that's been done. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I guess I have to, well, I don't quite go last because somebody else walked in, but um, so my name is Melissa, um, and, um, you know, obviously I've got a million different thoughts, but I wanted to sort of tag on to what Frank said, which is, I mean, I agree, and I've thought about all of those things, and I frankly don't have a strong personal opinion about what should happen, because, I mean, it's like, oh my God, it's mind-blowing, all of it. I ran for office, I ran for the House of Delegates, um, so I've been in politics, that you could say, you know, certainly since the 2016 presidential election. The thing everybody needs to know is this, the abortion stuff, Ralph, Justin, Mark, that seems like, oh my God, how unlucky could we possibly be? And Frank's shaking his head. Understand something, and it gives me goosebumps. This was a calculated attack, and they are good at it. And you know what? It worked. And my frustration is not with that, you know, all's fair, I guess. My frustration is, where is the leadership? Where is the Democratic leadership? Where's the House caucus? Where's the Senate caucus? Where are these people? And what are they doing? What is the plan? And I talk to people who know people inside that room, and you know what? There's no, no plan. plan. There's nobody in charge. The parents aren't home, the babysitter's gone, and they don't know what's happening. And that is true. So be afraid. Be very afraid. And it is not coincidental that the abortion stuff happened right before this. And I am good friends with Kathy Tran. Trust me. That woman who nursed her baby on the floor of the house, uh, you know, of the chamber, mm -hmm. is not a baby killer. Okay, this is this. They laid in wait for that abortion bill, and it's all come from that. So we have to be clear on that. These, all of these things are important, and we all have to look at our implicit bias. But this is calculated because the maps are about to change, and the Democrats have a chance to flip the whole entire legislature. So do you think accidentally bad timing that? this all came out? No. So remember that we're sad and we're upset and we're pissed and I want to get out of politics but because it's rough but you can't and we can't and remember that 400,000 Virginians have health care because of that man and let me I know my time is up but let me just say to Dr. Yeah. We, a lot of people supported Ralph because he doesn't have a PR person. And he is that way, and he stumbles and bumbles, honestly. And then the minute something goes sideways, and he doesn't have a PR firm to somebody else's point, the minute that goes sideways, it's like, oh my God, he's a disaster. He's the exact same as he has been All this whole entire time. So I think that's important to remember. I really, I really do. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Phillips? Um, hello, everyone. I apologize for being late. I'm actually coming from a class two buildings now. Um, my name is Erica Phillips, and I am running for school board in Chester County. Awesome. all have our personal opinions, but I am so focused on our school system and how to create justice and equity within the schools that I, I, I can't focus on that. Because we have to all do our part. There's justice and equity and racial um, barriers. We have to work at that, and if we get focused on something else, then we're not working on what we need to do individually and collectively. So I am just focused. I don't really, my opinion is not going to save our state. 
It's not going to change our state. I care about making sure the children who are our most vulnerable citizens get what they need educationally. So that's mine. Great, terrific. Um, I had a follow-up question that I wanted to ask, and then maybe we can open it up and other people can ask questions or bring up topics. So I've seen a recurring theme about leadership. Melissa brought it up, Charles brought it up, some other people brought it up. And this is kind of an abstract question that I'm asking, but what does leadership look like in this situation? Do we want people to make quick decisions? Do we want people to communicate more? Do we want people to be out in front having things like this? What are we looking for in our leaders? <laughs> I'm telling you, I talk to people who know what's going on inside that room. It's chaos. First of all, take a breath. Take a collective breath, which they did not do. Ralph ran out and said, oh. Take a breath. You go into the war room. You go into crisis mode. You have a crisis comms company, firm, that comes in. The problem is with this impending, hey, we could take the house, is that we don't know how to lead from a majority. When was the last time we had a majority? I, I literally don't know the last time, if ever, we've had a majority, right? In like modern, <laughs> you know, since back in the day. We don't know how to lead except by defense. What about Tommy Norman? What about <laughs> Kirk Cox? Like, we're like, oh yeah, that's good. All the students hated him. Oh, Tommy Norman, like totally racist yearbook. It's like, oh. And it goes away. It goes into the ether. In 2017. So in his classes, the <coughs> students are talking about how right. racist he was. So we're two years defense. ago. Right. We're scattered, disorganized, and the people around Governor Northam are young and inexperienced. We have people who've dealt with this in the Democratic Party. You might want to call them, and we're not. We're just. It's a. It's a awful. I don't know. I mean, what do you think, right? Does anyone else have anything to say on that? I agree, 100. Every time I've called up <clears throat> to the state Democratic Party and wanted to talk to somebody, they put me on hold. Yes. When this whole thing was coming down, the quick, quick thing is, the Republicans, there was, there was one Republican gentleman who got a little too tipsy at a cocktail party, spilled out all these things that he was gonna, they were gonna do on court. We knew they were coming, all right, so we prepared. I called the state Democratic headquarters at least six times, other people did, they never got back to us. They never got back, they never communicated with us. And a number of other people have called up to them to ask them to do research or to help us organize. Or even we had just one young lady called right up to them asking them about Information Act to, to get information about from the county government about things that we want to know about, about contracts. And we, the response was, was not positive. And they, they said they didn't want to get involved in, in something like this. There is no leadership. There are great people, we have great candidates up there on the state level, but I have not seen, coming from Pennsylvania, I have not seen where they give you research, information, and coordination, and statistical information, and help enhance like that. And so I would say that there is a definitely, this leadership should have known two years, three years ago, when Trump sent his people down, that this was gonna be changing. They should have known that last year when we had a senator running on the Republican side who was an out and out white supremacist, they should have known when they came after Courtney Lynch what was happening. When they sent in spies on Abigail, they should have known. Those were all signals coming down. The big question I have is, why are they doing it now? And listen, I agree with you, it's gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It's, it, if they really wanted to win these races in November, this would have been brought out in September. Right. It's out now, and this is, they're, they're, they're giving us the opportunity, and I don't see us responding properly to that. And, and it's a game of chess, and they, they play their, their move, but I, don't, I see it on the grassroots, the blue wave, we're, come, we're doing our move. I don't see the move coming down for the state. Um, I didn't say much before, I was supposed to be <laughs> um, if you want to hear my question, I don't know that. Come on. <laughs> Whatever you're talking about. Right? 
You need to talk to yeah. her. I should no. probably say everything, though. You're right. Instead of yeah, go ahead and scream. But I have no notes because I kept thinking. I, I started kind of early, so I have I'm not going to respond to. Go. Um, I also initially supported Northern. I mean, from his candidacy because of his. He's um, unpolished, and I felt very sincere, and that you could. And which I think is interesting, but I, but I trusted also in his issues, which were him being a doctor, it made sense with my issues, were very much aligned with the Medicaid expansion and the opioid crisis. I'm like, he understands mental health is important. And to me, those were really high on my priority list. And so I was very pro more than I had a sticker on and everything. And I'm not going to come down really on what we should do on either side about I, I could, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and talk this out. <laughs> um, Take your time. Because, yeah, I'm going to talk this out a little bit. Because the college excuse to me, um, the, these young excuse and the 84 thing, I wasn't old or anything, like old enough to, I was old enough to know what the 80s was about, though. And um, so I do, I, mean, I was alive, I was like 10 or something. So. Um, <laughs> But I mean, like, I was, I was lucid, I promised you. <laughs> I watched TV and everything. I watched Three's Company. And, I mean, I was around. I, try, I promise you. Dukes of Hazard, all of it. Um, Dukes? Yeah, I liked it, too. So, <laughs> Dukes of Hazard. Um, but um, I just don't think that we can really underplay the blackface, despite the fact that some people, I do know the South, too. I'm from Tennessee. So I'm not shocked that there's like a closet, people think it's in people's closet. But I want to put next to that, that we are asking in almost every election for the black community and for the minority communities, marginalized communities, to be the winning, we're going to those communities hopefully, and we should too. We want to have some about civic engagement in those communities, we want those communities represented. But if we're going to go there for their vote mm -hmm. and then behave as if what our sensibilities are are <laughs> irrelevant or silly or underplay them when there's a real offensive, it's not a good sign at all. I mean, it, it could be insensitivity, but the way he's responded has been ridiculous. His, but, his, but his policies have been all right. Um, what he wants to continue, I, I'm saying there's both sides of this, and I understand that. But I just don't think that telling about the black community how to feel, and then also expecting them to be all forgiveness, because we're used to victimization, really. And we, if you want that to change, I, just, I think it's ridiculous, actually, to expect. Um, well, I think it's not ridiculous. You can expect the community to say it's always been around, and we're used to it. And, we get the policies, but you want something to, to get better for real. Zero, zero tolerance is a choice. It's a possibility. We could let's just consider it because new leadership is needed, in my opinion. Um, I mean, this is not neat and pretty, and and it's not. But it also is a public, we're a democratic party, and we're not supposed to be hypocrites. And that's what it looks like to a lot of people. And people who are already disengaged will stay disengaged and say both parties are the same. Because that's what they're saying. So that's how I see it. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think that it should be ignored. But I do think that we should use, use this experience and, and demand that he does things to help the community. Taking him out of office does not hold him accountable. That just removes him. I think holding him accountable and, and having him to do things to uplift the black community, do things to um, support the black community in, in, in larger ways, pulling new um, people of color in politics. And, and and because that's how you change that. You have you add more voice. But putting him out of office doesn't hold him accountable. What's gonna to happen to him? He's already served as governor. Nothing happens. I think it's important to make him accountable by so really supporting the community. 
I see opportunity as well. I really do. I, I really do. But I don't know why it's got to turn up to anger and like the realness. Yeah, I don't of, think it should be a word. Of um, that type of thing. And also, the, the, I wanted to bring up, not that's not, that's not what I want us to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you said as a, as a you start muscle and, and the bargaining, yes. Like, you start, yes, I believe in using that muscle we do have right now to um, get in the politics, political, political climate to get him to, to even do even better. Like, what, what is it? Um, Union Hill with the pipe, with the um, environmental, I don't know everything about it, but I know it's, it's, like, it's definitely his pipeline. It's going to be effective as a, a minority, I mean, a majority um, African American community. And that's where we can get him to open his eyes and also have, have to reckon with these things like this. And I like that. But I also just wanted to say that that, that will have to be shown. You have to do that, I guess, because I really think that looking at it in some, in some people's perspectives that I've been open to, is what I'm really coming from, is that I hear so many disengaged people from the entire um, process, and the, it doesn't help any. I mean, I think we all know that it's kind of debacle, we're making a joke of it. So, um, were they yeah, very strategic very before? Dis they were disengaged before, but we also are going around trying to. We really want them to be engaged. Yes. And that's what I'm saying is that, that we need them to be engaged. Yes. And um, it's for so many reasons, of course. There's like multiple levels of that. But for the entire democracy, OK? <laughs> for function and for education is very important. But I'm just saying um, that needs to change and the kind of thing you're talking about, hopefully, it would be a step in the right direction. And I hope that's what something like that is. Well, so you can. Okay. Uh, I, I know, I also forgot to tell you, that for the last 13 years, Governor Northam is a member of a predominantly black church. <laughs> and his that. minister is black. And so he really can see perspective as well from all the sides of what he was growing up. But the other thing is, you know, you're talking about discrimination and everything else. I come from an immigrant family in western Pennsylvania. There was a Ku Klux Klan very active and still is in Little Export, Pennsylvania. But they weren't, there was no blacks in the area. They burned across in front of my grandfather's farm because we were immigrants. And my parents' generation, there were uh, people who, young, women and men who were educated, college educated, and they could not get a job once they graduated until Roosevelt became elected. And that's why our people were all Democrats, because that's the only way we could get ahead. So I just want to tell you that there's been discrimination and all the way through, and we're working very hard for it. And blackface is horrible. I, I, I didn't know exactly what it was, but there is also a wonderful, program or, or an article in the Outlook by this professor at Princeton about the history of what's happening in blackface. And the reason a lot of people, the young people don't realize it is because when the integration of the schools came about, the, the, the um, strong black mamas, when they saw what was going on in their schools, what their kids were going to be taught, the songs and everything else, they put a, this was in the 50s and 60s, a big campaign to get it up. And a lot of people today really aren't aware of it. You have to look and see what it was, and it was horrible. But it is horrible. It is black, horrible. You know, black face still happens. It happens every year. Kind of it, yeah, it happens every year. In 2000, and, uh, it happened in 2017. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. the kids at uh, UVA. It's That's still so going on now. Well, I mean, I'm not from Virginia originally, but like, there's absolutely blackface going on in schools all over the country. <laughs> like, it's not gone wide. Mm -hmm. It's right. not. But well, uh, I think we this is making awareness to it. Though. This is right down. But a lot of people are really. Uh, and it is hard. And I think it's, it, it's, it's, you know, we, we do know that discrimination happens to multiple groups, but when you look at the African American community, you're not just talking about discrimination. No. We're talking about going back to slavery yeah, and then oppression and you know there's there's a whole historical path it's not just discrimination 
So that's what makes it so much more uh, disgusting. Well, like, did you come? Yes, um, I was just to, to uh, Melissa and Frank's comment. I'm, I'm thinking we should use this. The Democratic Party should not lose focus on what is more important because this coming out within a three week or two week period, everything happening within a two week period. I think it's, I mean, it's, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> you know, I'm not going with that big word, you know. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm totally with it because it is, it is a targeted disruption to stop the blue wave momentum in Virginia, and I don't think we should let that go. I, you know, I don't want to say I understand how the black face affected people because I don't know. I have done little research, but not a whole lot. But I don't think we should just jump on the bandwagon and say he should resign. I think the Democratic Party should stand up, pull up their socks, and work together to make 2019 elections count and tell them that even though you did this to us, we are still going ahead right. and we're going to be focused on the elections and we're going to win them and we're going to make a change and make it happen instead of trying to pull down our own party. Yeah. And, and with that in mind, being running and also you have an African American running for sheriff in the whole county. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we do have right. minorities running. I would like to take the, the focus away from elective politics for a second and face Virginia's situation. Uh, regardless of how you, their legal status, the fact is that in 1619, uh, our English ancestors incorporated Africans to, do, to work on plantations. And over the 17th century, gradually, that system turned into slavery. And we can't forget that by the uh, 19th century, first half of the 19th century, Virginia was a slave-producing state. Mm -hmm. Slaves were our export. And then slavery was gone. We went to Jim Crow. The court said no Jim Crow. And we sat around for 10 or 15 years saying we'd rather close our schools than to integrate. We have a uh, shameful history on the race relations. And I don't think it's really gone away. It may not be the way it was before, but I think slave, uh, that racism is alive and well in Virginia. And I think since the election of that man at, from New York, it's now considered okay. You're allowed to be racist now. Uh, and I think we need to start talking to each other about it. One of the things, when I came to Richmond, I was shocked by the segregated nature of this town you know, in the 21st century. Uh, interestingly enough, all the activities I got involved in, the only time I was able to sit in the same room with people of color was at the Democratic Committee. There was nothing else going on in Richmond where, where blacks and whites talked to each other. Uh, and I, don't, I think we walk past each other on the street, maybe we'll wave and say hello, maybe instead of waving we'll look down at our feet so we don't have to make eye contact. We need to work on this, this problem. We need to talk to each other about this problem that has infected our society for 400 years. So I'm very happy that we, we can talk about the politics of it. We need to talk about the societal basis of it. So that, that's the end of my discussion. And I realize I left someone out. Do you have anything to say? This is my campaign manager. Oh, she doesn't <laughs> <laughs> I have no opinion. <laughs> Um, I think it's been really hard. I mean, I invested a lot of my time in Ralph's campaign. I worked for an organization called New Virginia Majority, and we went into majority minority communities, and we talked to them about how Ralph and Mark were going to be advocates for racial justice. I spent a lot of time talking with Justin about my own rape and how it affected me and my experiences with Title IX in schools. And all I can say is that for the past two weeks, I felt utterly betrayed by how they have reacted. And it's not that they don't have a PR firm, it's that they knew that these allegations were coming. Ralph knew 24 hours ahead of time. He had that statement prepared. He had a heads up. You should have known, and you should have been ready to say something. And 
it, it's just been really heartbreaking and hard for me and other staffers who worked hundreds of hours trying to get them in office to see just an absolute utter betrayal of the values that we fought for. Is this the first meeting of this type by a candidate or an elected official? I, this is the first one I've seen from a candidate. It was something on Sunday, but I don't know who organized it. It wasn't a candidate. No, 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 no. It, wasn't, it wasn't. It was some other similar time. And to be honest with you, we were advised against doing this, but I went ahead with it anyway because I think we need to come out here and talk. I don't think we're going to solve our problems online. I don't think we're going to solve our problems by taking it and sweeping it under a uh, rug. It just, it's just going to fester. And we, we don't know how to react to it next time. If we don't come together, then our problems are just going to keep getting worse. The Republicans are just going to keep coming to us and stuff. And we don't know how to react. I think on my part, I've been really frustrated with the leadership that I've been seeing. So I want to be a leader. So I'm looking to the leaders that we already have to see how they're reacting. And I've been frustrated. I've been frustrated. It hasn't felt like people are communicating from the heart. It seems like there's been a lot of statements that just say stuff. Um, I want people to talk to us. I want my leaders to talk to me. Whether it's a video that you post online, whether it's a Q&A session, even if they go online and say, we don't know, we don't know what's going to happen, it's really useful to hear from them. So I think I'm not a leader yet, and as a constituent, I want to see the Democratic Party, I want to see our leadership be out there, be in front of it, but in front of the whole situation, because they're the ones that need to give us confidence when things seem like they're falling apart. When we've been knocking doors, what we've been hearing is people are really insecure about the government. And we have a federal government that is falling apart. It's completely dysfunctional. And it's been the state governments that have been holding things up these last two years. And we can't let the state government fall apart now. But that's one of the big reasons that I wanted to do something like this, is that people need a chance to talk. I think, and I hope everyone's going to leave here feeling better and feeling like they had a chance to air what they're feeling. Um, we're going to do a lot of these on different topics where I stop talking and I just listen and we get to talk to each other. But I hope that's a useful experience to everyone that we're, when we're doing this. It is. Yes. It, it is. is. It is. is. There's, there's, um, well, I'm part of the Chesterfield Young Democrats, and the weekend after all this stuff started coming out about Northam, we decided to hold something like this. So if anybody like wants, on the um, on the 28th, the last Thursday of the month, we're having a meeting at Chester Library um, and just inviting like lots of people to just Good. come and talk. It's part of the reason that I came here because I wanted to like see what the you know the good ideas for the format of our talk. <laughs> <laughs> Just to see what the old people do. <laughs> <laughs> it's an all ages conversation. Um, we're just I just, moderating. first of all, of course, I appreciate Shannon. I first got to know Shannon when I was here at my alma mater, and she was an undergrad. And similarly, I was um, here because of the way the school administration was handling sexual assault um, cases, if you will. So that's how, when I became active in that, and that's how I got to know Shannon. And, and we have similar stories in that way. I think it's important to tease out that the situation with Ralph, and that's the other thing that's painful to me. Like, I know these people, like Shannon, like I call Ralph and Justin and Mark, right? Mark and I did a, like a meet and greet thing here because we both went to UR, right? So, but what happened with Ralph and the way he responded, and what happened with Justin and the way he responded, and what happened with Mark and the way he responded, are not created equal. And as an elected official I was talking to said, you know, the Justin situation, he, he's being accused of a violent felony, right? And, and so, and I'm not saying one's, you know, like what's, it's all bad, right? But I think it's important to, you know, the, there are three different things. And, and what I've heard from electeds that I've heard from, which is more on the national level, is, you know, Mark came out, there's no picture. You know, he just was like, hey, I'm just going to come out with it. He handled it. He's making appropriate outreach. He's, he's saying the appropriate things. He's doing the appropriate things. 
And it's very different, I think. And to Shannon's point, which I was shocked to hear, it's like Ralph had 24 hours to say that. It wasn't like he was walking out of a building and somebody walked up to him and put a microphone in his face. But I think we have to remember that. And we're very aware, or I try to be aware, and a friend of mine posted on Facebook. And the only thing I could say, honestly, somebody who's African American, and you know, I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't, what can I say? I mean, you know, uh, arguably, like I'm in a, I'm in a privileged position, I think. But let's not forget the sexual assault survivors because there were some threads on Facebook fr yes. from uh, uh, people I would call allies <laughs> that I blew my mind. Let's just put it that way. The just like a bit, you don't know what you don't know, and don't start saying stuff that it's like, oh gosh, you have, you clearly have no idea. Number two observations from being here tonight. Number one is, do you think after Tommy Norman and all these other things come out, are, do Republicans ever get in the room and have these conversations? I mean, maybe they do, but I just, it struck me like, oh, I bet not. Um, and the other thing is all the Republicans, you immediately call for Ralph to resign because, you know, we have zero tolerance suddenly for racism of any kind. I would like to see them um, on the bandwagon for getting rid of the Confederate statues. And I, I have yet to see that. And as soon as that conversation circles back around, it's going to be, well, you know, maybe racism isn't racism. And, you it's know, white supremacy <laughs> isn't white supremacy. And, and, and it's cool Right, right. So, um, you know, I think we have, we're holding ourselves accountable, which is really important. But I don't think there's accountability on the other side, and let's not, you know, let's also not lose 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 sight of that as well. You know, you just open up a can of worms. This is long term, too, the short term. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's the first thing I thought of because you did see these Republicans saying, you know, Ralph has to resign. Oh my God, this is horrible. And then I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder how many of them we have to keep the better statues, or yes. you know, who knows? Didn't I mean, thank goodness for Arthur Ashe Boulevard this week, but. You know, so it's like what's good for the goose, you know, let's yeah. let's remember these conversations and these state statements uh, like I said. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm particularly disgusted by Republicans jumping out is because I have lived in Chesterfield for two years and the first thing that I learned about Chesterfield County politics when I moved in was I asked um, I moved into Chesterfield and I didn't have a car. So I asked my mom where the nearest bus stop was and she told me that we didn't have buses in Chesterfield to keep the riff raff out of Richmond. Oh. That's a quote. Um, so, uh, you know, over the, over the, you know, next, like the last two and a half years, I've been like asking people about the state of public transportation in Chesterfield and, you know, and no one has disagreed with me that it's about racial segregation. So for Republicans in Chesterfield specifically to get on their high horse about more fun is just enraging because I am so angry that my coworker, um, that I found out that my coworker uh, a couple of weeks ago has been walking three miles to work down Buford Road and down uh, down the Lothian Turnpike to get to the mall. Um, three miles there, three miles back, every, like, um, a couple times a week since October, and there's no buses. I am enraged. I am enraged that Jefferson Davis had, had transportation and it was taken away. Because, and I am just, I am infuriated that any Republican in Chesterfield thinks that they have a right to, to go on about how racism is unacceptable when one of the driving forces of, of Chesterfield politics is trying to keep Chesterfield County segregated from Richmond City because the stereotype is that black people are in Richmond City and Chesterfield County is white. I am furious that any Chesterfield Republican thinks that they have the high ground on this and I really, really want to throw it to their faces over the next couple of months. And I want to go on offense, frankly, which I know everybody's like, uh, but I mean, frankly, I want like every single Board of Supervisors candidate, I don't even know who they are, but I want them all to come out and be like, all right, let's end institutional racism and get buses in Chesterfield County. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. I am so tired of being on defense for these assholes. And I think it's very ironic that, as we were talking, you were mentioning Jefferson Davis. <laughs> yes, yes. Right, <laughs> right. Exactly. So great that we don't even know. Mm -hmm. to, to your point, the mm -hmm. reason GRTC wasn't going to short pump was the similar yeah. thing. They yeah. did not Same. want. Yeah. They did not want. You know. They the undesirable. Yeah. They didn't want undesirable people getting people out there. Getting they didn't there, want low-income so. people, aka yes. black people, from getting out there. And it's just like, and you have the nerve 
to get on your high horse and start talking about this stuff. All right, well, I'm gonna like, let's throw it in their faces and be like, oh, you're so against racism. Put more buses into the county. Stop treating Richmond City like it's a leper colony um, because because it's because it's it's majority black people. I mean, it's like oh, you want to pretend that this is that this is okay. All right, well, you know, put your money where your mouth is, or shut the hell up. My mouth, my mouth, baby. Um, I think it's important that these type of conversations include African Americans because we're having these conversations and when you look around the room, though it is diverse, you don't have a large representation of African Americans and that's what we're talking about and I think that is part of the problem is that there are many conversations had and there are many decisions being made but the people you're having the conversations about, the people you're making the decisions for, are not in the room. Mm -hmm. And so that is the first change that I personally think has to happen. Hear from the people that's being impacted. And it's great to have people that are supporting. It's great to have people that are uplifting. It's, it's great to have people that are advocating. But you need to have the voice of the people so I just wanted to you. And actually, we are trying to have a lot of events on the eastern part of the district. Mm -hmm. We don't want to ignore that part of the district. It's the Belmont area. Mm -hmm. And if anyone can help us get people out to those events, we want to be there with them as well. So we are trying. Okay. Just are we getting to uh, Yeah, so a couple things. First, on the hypocrisy of the Republicans on this northern picture is depressingly unsurprising to me yeah. that they were hypocritical on this. Like, all you have to do is look back, remember Roy Moore, remember a president. <laughs> like, it, yeah. they have been very, it's very consistently, you could literally set a clock to how consistently they have very much defended horrendous people. There was, I forget his name, was that white supremacist, this Republican congressman. You have to be more specific. <laughs> for 17 years before the Republican Party decided to kick him off those committees. It took 17 <coughs> years for them to get around to it. Oh, like, in New York, that person? It was, uh, you know, it was on the federal level. I think uh, it was, it was on the King. King. Yeah. King. King. Yeah. Yeah, so, and then the second thing was with the uh, Fairfax. At this point, especially the second allegation, there's enough cooperating it that I think it's true. What really depresses me about that was, if we assume these allegations are true, especially the first one, that woman's sexual assault was used as a political weapon. The website that released it was the same mm -hmm. conservative pro-life website that released the Northam picture. It was, they took this horrendous thing that happened to this woman and turned it into a political weapon to assassinate a public official. And to take what happened to someone that's so horrendous and just use it for their own political ends is straight up diabolical. Yeah, I agree. So, so I have a, a question I wanted to ask you all. So I'm, I'm running for office, obviously, and this time next year I hope to, to be in office. What would you want for me in a year? Something like this happens. Disclose what I'm you hiding. of Don Adams, I was really, um, I was really, uh, I've been very pleased by her um, legislative assistant for the day program where you take regular citizens into the halls and you like show them around and show them this is what this means, this is what this means. I mean, I think that, you know, the Virginia, um, the Virginia legislature has made some important strides toward transparency. Like I didn't know that before like two or three years ago, like committee votes weren't like streamed, which would really suck if they weren't because I've been listening to them for the past like three weeks. Um, just at work. 
Um, and uh, but I, I think that you know regular people like getting them to um, to come in and, and and see like what the decorum and like courtesy and like etiquette actually is would sort of demystify it. So I have really liked her program, and I know that there's no one else in the legislature that's doing anything like that, so I would like to see I think that. that's a great idea. Yeah. 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 So I would like to see yeah. something from like yeah. that. And it was really fun. <laughs> it was yes. really fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You were, oh yes, yes, you were. You were. <laughs> um, I was going to say, aside from being a candidate, as you know, a citizen, I think that I would have liked for someone to have to say something to kind of give the community a way to look at this and how to move forward, not not controlling their opinion, or not, but just, okay, this has happened. These are the things that are, are being said. As a community, this is how it affects us, or how it could affect us. And being open to hearing what people have to say, but having using resources. So maybe for all of the African American constituents you have, maybe talking with or having your um, team to talk with some specialists um, like therapists and people who can guide them through this process. Using, using the resources to kind of bring the community back together because you can't change what has happened. But I think that all elected officials and all leaders their job is to create balance, to create togetherness, to, to help people move forward. So I haven't seen where anyone's saying, hey, this has happened. If this has affected you in this way, you can reach out to this person or reach out to this organization, and they're willing to help. For example, when, with the shutdown, there were so many organizations that were doing things to assist the families that were being affected by the sh shutdown. Well, where are the organizations that are assisting community members that are being affected by this? So just using those resources and helping people um, move forward and deal with what's happening, I think that's important, very important. Frank? Yeah. <clears throat> Talk. Uh, Frank, you quite shocked when I was talking with some of our House Delegates members and, and senators that the lack of information that they get on upcoming bills from particular agencies or groups. And I, th I think uh, if you could come back to us next year or something and say, hey, this bill here I voted because my advisors who I've created who were specialists in education, in, 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 in social issues, in transportation or something. When this bill came up or these bills came up, I took it to them and asked them to give me input on it before I go and vote on it. Yes. Because uh, that was shocked to find out that the State Democratic Party does not have a research unit that analyzes the bills and how it particularly affects your constituents. Exactly. I think you should call it all the students that's all, but it's only on our drills. And they're not technically going to Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone else have anything that they want to share this evening about how we can go forward? Or? I just want to support you because you were an attorney. Maybe the last time the majority of the lawmakers were attorneys was 70 some years ago or so. I don't know if you know that statistic. Um, most of the lawmakers I deal with have no idea what's going on, frankly. Mm. I've had too many negative experiences. And I think mm. partly it's driven to the fact that they don't understand how the law works. Like someone educated in them, and they also don't know how to speak in front of people honest, like a lawyer would from the judge. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I actually agree with you. And uh, strange as it sounds, I'm looking forward to going through bills word by word and <laughs> <laughs> keeping them by my bedside table and reading them over and over again. And I'm also awkwardly proud, so that helps too. <laughs> I guess before we close, can you give us a little overview on your platform and who you are, why you're running, and uh, the part of immigration and law, what you bring to the table? Sure, I would love to do that. Well, um, as you can probably guess, I am from an immigrant family. We we're first-generation Indians. My parents moved here in the early 1960s, and my 
my sister and brother-in-law are in there as well. Um, back then, there were not enough doctors in rural areas. And the reason that my family came here is my dad was a physician, and he came to serve the underserved areas in West Virginia. And then we got our green card, and we were able to stay. And I think my mom said, OK, now we can leave. But <laughs> <laughs> I think my dad made the decision that he wanted to stay in a rural area and to serve those people. So that's where I grew up. We grew up in this little town called Woodfield, West Virginia. I think um, 11 people live there now, maybe. <laughs> um, very, very small, very modest area. We went to high school there, and then I went on to law school at Cornell Law School in upstate New York. And um, when I was here in law school in 1992, one of the pivotal moments for me is I was watching the Anita Hill hearings with my classmates. And as we were watching these hearings, we were thinking, oh my gosh, is this going to be us? You know, what kind of a legal world are we going into where women are not respected? So that was a very important kind of experience for me. And so when I got out of law school, my first job was to work in a civil rights law firm up in Philadelphia. And we did civil rights, and we did union side labor, and we did employment discrimination. And it was interesting, one of the first cases I took was a sexual harassment case. And um, the woman had been harassed horribly. She was a lower income woman who worked in a custodial position. And we settled that case for a whopping $7,000. <laughs> And what's really difficult for me as I look back on that experience is I think we would lose that case today. I don't think we settled it for anything. So it's that backwards trend that really motivated me. Another thing that came up is um, in 1989, I was out marching for reproductive rights in Washington. I don't know if anyone else was at that march. And I was talking to my daughter a couple of weeks ago, who's a freshman at um, the college in Philadelphia, and she told me that she was out marching for reproductive rights. And my first thought is, well, I'm so proud. But then my second thought is, oh my gosh, are my grandchildren going to be doing this? <laughs> so I'm not happy with the direction of our country. I mean, that's an understatement. And I'm the kind of person that was really happy to stay behind the curtain and never get on the stage, and just I'm happy to just do the work. But now in this environment, where we have a racist president and we have racist immigration policies. I don't want to stay behind the curtain anymore. I want to get out of my comfort zone and I want to represent the diverse community. The 12th district is extremely diverse. There's numerous immigrant populations who feel disenfranchised. They don't feel like they're part of the system. And I think I'm a good representative of those people. So that's a big reason why I'm running. I'm not satisfied with the direction of the country. And every day it's something. It's something where I see that we've gone in the wrong direction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If anybody want to get in contact with you, what, how would they do that? Um, yes. So, uh, do we have any contact information here? Oh, uh, we have business cards. Okay. okay. Um, so the website is beinalothe.com, and you can go to the website and you can sign up to volunteer. Or you can sign up to donate. It's a particular society for us. <laughs> Um, and send us an email. We're looking for volunteers. We are going full fledged right now. The campaign is going great. We have over 200 volunteers. Everything is going really well. We're really happy with the enthusiasm. Thank you. Can we get a group picture? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm patient. You getting in? You getting in? I got the picture. I got the picture. Okay, I'll take it. Come on. All right. Come on. You are You get in? Yeah, come on. Come on. All right, come on. Yeah, come on. Come on up, come on up, yeah, come on, close it up, close it up. Come on, you get in? Come on, Matthew. 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 Come on,
Okay, here we go. Later. One more. Two more, I'm sorry. Hold it, don't move. Come on. Come on here. One more. Yeah, well. How many books do you have? No, this is somebody else's. Yeah. What I'll do with this one right here, I'll send it to everybody who wants one. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Come on now. Yeah.